new things. Somebody's got some new things coming their way. And it goes on. It says, all these things are from God. All these things, these new things in your life are from God who gave you the ministry of reconciliation. Amen. You have a ministry of reconciliation or bringing things back to where they're supposed to be. Everybody say, I'm new. I'm new. I'm shiny. I'm shiny. I'm sure. Okay. <laughs> I'm new. I'm new. I'm shiny. I'm shiny. I'm mighty. I'm mighty. Come on, I'm new. Old stuff is gone. Come on, everybody with me. Anger? Anger. Meet peace. Meet peace. Complaining? Complaining. Meet satisfied. Meet oh, come on. Fearful? Yes. Meet faithful. Yes. Sinner? Sinner? Come on, meet holy. Holy. Wishy washy. Do it like me. Come on. Wishy washy. Yeah, you're all on film. You look retarded. Wishy washy. Meet stability. Come on. I'm stable. I'm holy. I'm faithful. I'm satisfied. I'm walking in my new identity because it's who He created me to be. Come on. Come on. Let me close and say this. There's some things, this new identity, you've got to know. See, if I end my message right there, and that's where I had it ended until yesterday. If I ended it right there, that gives you the, the thought process, the teaching of who you're supposed to be. Let me tell you how to get there. Amen. Amen. Let me tell you three things in my own life that I have seen God do. First of all, if you're going to walk in this new identity and where new things are going to come to you, where you're going to have this new ministry of walking in the spirit of reconciliation, where you're going to do the thing that you cannot do normally, but only God can do. If you're going to get out and walk on the water, not because you're focused you know, on, on Jesus or this or that, but because you're, you're focused on Him, but you know who you are. See, if... How many of you just enjoy getting involved in everybody's messes? <laughs> we do that. Listen, I'll tell you why you do that. Because you're searching for your identity. You're searching for your purpose. You're searching for your ministry. Maybe God wants to use me to help these people. Maybe God wants me to show them or help them get through them. And so we get entangled in everybody else's messes. But when you know who your identity is, when you know who you are in Christ, you don't have to get involved in every mess that comes your way. Somebody just got set free right there. Come on, somebody just got liberated, right? There. You don't have to wrap everybody else's messes around you. You can just say, you know what, bless God. I'll pray for you right now. And you pray and you leave it. Come on. There are times where you are going to totally get Get entangled in other people's stuff because God wants you to go in there and begin to pick apart the weave and mess that they've been in because you have that ministry because you've been through deliverance because you've been uh, an overcomer of alcohol or drugs or come out of a lifestyle or whatever it is to where he'll send you in there and you will become entangled in everything so you can set them free but you don't have to be entangled in everything how do we know which ones to get entangled in and which ones we know we know who we are we know our identity in God. The first thing, one of three, is you have to have a foundation of God's word in your life. First and foremost. Because God's word not only gives you your identity, but it gives you your purpose. It shows you who he is. It shows you how he works. It shows you how he handles things. And we merely reflect what he does. It gives you your identity. If you're not in God's word, you will not be able to follow in the supernatural the identity that God has for you, period. Well, I will come and get fed on Sunday. You will miss who you are. Well, I will turn on radio programs or I will get daily devotion sent to my iPhone or to my iPod or to my laptop or my dad. Well, you will miss your identity. You're getting somebody else's identity sent to you. And I don't know about you, but I don't want anybody else's identity. I want Marty's identity. I want the identity that God has for me. I don't want Joyce Meyer's identity. I appreciate her and I'm thankful for her. I, you know and, and I'm not saying she's perfect or flawless, far from it. I don't want Charles Stanley. I don't want John Harkey's identity. I don't want Sean Smith. I don't want Brian Orr. I want Marty's identity. And the only way I'm going to find it is when I get in God's word every day myself and let him open that up. Amen. Number two, second thing is hearing the voice of God. See, some of you are desperate. Some of you right now want to hear the voice of God. All these things you've gone through have been God's way of training you to listen. And I hope you've learned. It has taken me, I've been, I've been pastoring for 18 years, and it's taken me 16 years. I don't want to discourage you, but it's taken me 16 years to be open to his voice. And that's because I'm a slow learner. 
It's because I'm from the Midwest. We do things way slow back there. We, everything's kicked back back there. Come on. And it's take, it may not take, in fact, I believe God is going to fast forward everybody. But the key is learning to distinguish his voice from the enemy's voice. Amen. Learning to distinguish his voice from your friend's voice. Learning to distinguish his voice even from your own voice. Yes. And that takes time. And I hope you've been learning to listen. You've been going through stuff, Joe. You've been going through stuff, Jason. Come on, you guys have been going through stuff. The reason isn't just to strengthen your face and get you to hunker down and become godly men and godly women in the sight of, you know, sorrow, crisis, and tragedy, but it's so that you can learn to listen to the voice of God so that when the next time you get in a situation that may be totally different, the one thing that will be totally the same is His voice. Amen. Even that way you don't have to know God in every circumstance because you know God and therefore every circumstance doesn't matter. His voice is the same. My sheep shall know my voice. Come on. He it never changes. His voice is the same. I can be out hunting and I can hear God tell me to go over here. And I can go over there and I know it's God's voice. There were things I was doing and it was like, you know what, I'm just going to stop and I waited a minute and then I proceeded. And because of that I was successful in what I wanted to do. Because God's voice is the same. Whether he's wanting to bless you or warn you. Whether he's wanting to direct you to go here or tell you to stop here, his voice is the same. The second thing we have to learn to do is recognize his voice. I believe that's where almost all of you are at right now today. You're being trained to hear his voice and be able to distinguish it from all that other clutter, all the other clanging, all the other banter, all the other uh, distractions and every other voice that's out there. God is teaching you to listen to his voice. And thirdly, we have to learn to wait on his presence. Give him a chance to finish what he started in your life. Give him a chance to not just open, see, we're sitting here, we're in the Word of God. He's given us our identity. He's given us our purpose. We're going out now. We know what we're called to do and we're doing it. Here we go, and we're on fire. Come on. We get the first step, and we've learned to hear God's voice. So we're following God's voice, and God says, I want you to go over here. So we go over here, and we get impatient. The presence of God shows up, and it opens up a door, and we're waiting for God to do something, and God doesn't do it, so we take and we leave. We figure maybe God's over here. Maybe I missed his voice. So we start going around and we frantically, before long, we start running everywhere trying to find out where he was because I know I heard his voice and maybe he's over here. We have to learn to wait. If you're going to walk in the anointing of God, the presence of God and the power of God, you have to learn to be still and wait because when God opens a door, sometimes we take off running before he completes what he wants to complete, before he reveals everything he wants to reveal. This church, our worship, we go longer than most churches. Amen. There's a reason. Because when we settle into that place of worship, that gives God not only a chance to show up, but for him to come and complete the reason why he showed up. Not just to come, but to come and complete what it was he wanted to do. Too many people want God to come in their life, but they're not patient enough to wait for him to finish it. It's okay as long as they come in their life and they're working on people around them. Lord, I want you to come in and fix my marriage and fix that wife of mine. And then God comes in and he starts working on her. Yeah, praise God, and I leave. But God said, no, wait a minute, now I won't fix you. No, what you did there was good, God. You worked on her. Marriage is going to be perfect now because she's finally fixed. Amen, guys. Come on, amen, guys. You chickens. <laughs> How do you know what I'm talking about? Yep. Okay. Waiting on God. Those are three things. If you're going to walk spiritually, I believe in the anointing of God, you've got to one, get in His Word. Because that's where He powers you. That's where, that's where He plugs in. Amen. Number two, listen, we've got to learn His voice. And you can learn his voice in a football game. You can learn his voice in a church service. You can learn his voice anywhere else that God can speak anywhere he wants at any time. And he'll, I will promise you, he will take the most bizarre time to speak to you. I'm brushing my teeth. 
18, 19 years ago in the morning when God's voice speaks to me for the very first time ever. I'm brushing my teeth. I'm not doing some great evangelistic missionary work over in Africa. I'm not laying hands on somebody praying for them. I'm not doing, I'm brushing my teeth in the voice of God. Come and speaks to me. And God will use your everyday life. Don't look for him to work in some great earthquake or some great blowing wind or some huge enormous fire. Look for him to speak in the still, quiet, small times of your life when your attention is there. Amen. Amen. And then when you learn to hear his voice, learn to stay there until God dismisses you because you don't want to miss an opportunity. Amen. Oh, amen. Let's go ahead and stand. <clears throat> I'm going to open up to pray with you, but I'll be honest with you. My, uh, <clears throat> my throat's kind of sore. I'm kind of got a sinus thing going on. I'm a little burned up here. I will stay and pray with you. And I won't breathe on you. <laughs> but I want, I want this to be the foundation of today. Listen, somebody in here, I think, is wanting a fast and furious life like Jehu. Amen? Let me tell you why I think Jehu represents the last day's church. The Bible says that Jehu was going to Jezreel to take care of two kings who needed to be destroyed. Because they were descendants of Ahab. And they were carrying on the bloodline of that corruption. So Jehu is riding his horse and his chariot. And he's going to the place where the kings are at in Jezreel. I believe it's King Joram and King Ahaziah. Are the two kings. One of Israel and one of Judah. And he's on his way. In the, and somebody on the tower looks out. And they see from a distance. Wow, somebody's coming. And they're coming fast. And so they send the messenger out. Go out and see who that is. And so the messenger rides in his horse, his chariot, and he goes out there and he says, sees that it's Jehu, a well-known commander of the army of God. He says, Jehu, is it, it's all well with you. Is there peace? And he goes, what peace is there with you? Get behind me. And so that messenger gets behind him and starts running with him. And the, the guy on the tower looks. He says, well, that messenger never come back. Let's send another one to see what's going on out there. So he sends another messenger. He gets in his horse and his chariot. He goes flying on out there. He says, Jehu, is all well with you? Is there peace? He goes, what peace do you have with me? Get behind me. He gets in line and he follows the other messenger and the rest of the army of Jehu. Is there heading fast? And the king looks up and he says, huh, we sent two messengers out, but they haven't come back. And that driving looks like the driving of Jehu. Come on. For he drives, this is what the Bible says, he drives fast and furious. 2 Kings chapter 9. He drives fast and furious. I don't have a problem speeding down the interstate. Come on. Because i got the spirit of Jehu. I'm going to use that next time I get pulled over. I'm sorry, officer. But i got the spirit of Jehu on me. Come on. And I have been, come on, I have been sent to drive fast. And let me tell you what that means spiritually. Come on. We are called to live a fast and furious life for Jesus Christ. We are called to go after the enemy and the things that he stands for with fury, with zeal, with passion. We don't just go back. When David ran to face Goliath, come on. He ran to the battle line. He didn't creep up to it. Come on. He ran to the battle line. That God is raising up a church, a kingdom of people who will run to Jezebel, who will not walk up there nonchalantly. We will go with a purpose and we will go with a passion. Amen. Fast and furious. The Spirit of Jehu. Hallelujah. I believe you in here. Listen, I believe God wants to give you that this morning. Some of you have been not sure about all this Holy Ghost stuff. Some of you have not been sure about all this glory stuff and all this present stuff. And, and, and I'm just saying God has got you where He's got you because that is where God wants you. And I'm going to just declare, if you want to get a hold of the spirit of Jehu, because I promise you, the spirit of Jezebel is upon us. I promise you. And there was one person who defeated Jehu, and it, or defeated Jezebel, and it was Jehu. Yes. And if we need anything today... It's not more teaching. It's not more preaching. Come on. We need people who are fast and furious in their relationship with the glory of God to defeat the works of the enemy. The enemy right now is operating in the supernatural. It's called false prophecies, false teaching, false healings, false miracles, false signs and wonders. That's what was prophesied to come to the church in the last day. How are we going to counter that? With Bible teaching? Huh? With binding Satan? Come on. We've been binding Satan for 40 years. And he's stronger than ever. I'll tell you what. When we get a hold of the glory of God. Amen. When the presence of God comes on you. And you stand up. And now there's anointing in the very words you speak. The three simple words used to just fall off your tongue. But now you got the anointing of God. And those three words carry power. 
Come on, they carry might. And the anointing of God can now break the yoke. You've been praying for people that they get delivered from this, that they stop doing this, and that they would have their eyes open. But once you get a hold of the glory of God, once the spirit of Jehu, come on, once that same glory that was on Jehu can get on you. Somebody in here wants a fast and furious anointing. Come on. Come on. I believe somebody in here wants a fresh prophetic ability so that when you're sharing the gospel with somebody else. How many in here want to share with an LDS friend? With an unsaved loved one, with an unsaved co-worker, whatever it might be. How many of you would love for the spirit of prophecy to come upon you as you're talking? And God open your eyes to see something in their life to where you can just say, oh my goodness, honey. Let me tell you, the spirit of the Lord is saying right now, and it hit right on the head. And that person just stand back and go, oh my. What? Oh. And then it opens the door to lay hands on and pray. And they receive Jesus and get saved. How many want that anointing? There is a prophetic anointing for the last days. There is a prophetic anointing. Because God says in Joel 2.28, He accomplished it in Acts chapter 2 where the beginning, not the end, but the beginning of it manifests. And I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. And your young men shall have visions. Come on. Come on. Amen. Glory to God. Some of you here, I believe we'll get that fresh prophetic unhoining upon you. I really believe that. I, you know, I believe that. I think we've been after the wrong things of God. Lord, bless me. Heal me. Lord, Lord, do this, do that. Lord, give me your anointing. Come on. Lord, put your glory on my life. I believe that's the prayer that God wants to answer because that's the prayer that takes you into your destiny. And not just satisfies your needs right here. God wants your destiny secured. Come on. God wants your future all laid out and ready. When Solomon built the house for God, when Solomon built the temple, it was because his dad David had prepared the way and given him everything he needed. Finances, contacts, uh, and everything he would need for that future. God has given that to you right now. And I believe God wants to secure your future today. Lastly, I believe there are people here today that would like to just have me lay hands on them and them get all that. Wouldn't it be great if you could just come up here and if I could just go boop, 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 boop. Woo. Huh? Wouldn't that be awesome? Connie, hold your arm up like that. Like a slot machine. Ching, ching. <laughs> Woo. Prophecy. Glory to God. Come on, put your hand up. Woo, healing, come on, teach it, hallelujah. See, but that's not the kingdom of God. Mm -mm. What Elijah did was he called to the sons of the prophet and said, I want you to go. What I'm going to do this morning is simply say, I want you to go. Every day, common people like myself, God has called us to do supernatural things. Every one of us, amen. Do you believe that? You see, because it doesn't do any good if you don't believe that. Don't come up if you don't believe that. Come on, if you don't have faith to believe that God is wanting you to do supernatural things, don't even come on up. But if you believe that God wants to do that, we're going to come up here and we're going to stand together and we're going to cry out. We're going to ask God, come on, we're going to knock on the door.